question is, can we use sound waves within human hearing levels to resonate and destroy graphene oxide particles and sheets? Can this also be applied principle-wise to graphene hydroxide? Um, if you or someone you care about has recently had this substance introduced into their bodies, it's probably like a significant concern. Um, there's not a whole lot of you know good ways to get it out of the body. We know that it appears to have a lifespan of roughly three months, depending on how it was introduced into the body. So we know that it breaks down. Um, <clears throat> if we could use some kind of a simple sound media device where we could you know play frequencies that resonate in such a way to destroy and or shorten its lifespan, that could be huge. You know, and a, a really simple example would be, let's say that there's, you know, a person that has a compromised health situation to begin with, and then they have the sub substance introduced into their body. You know, if, if you could shave the life cycle of the substance down, even by a third, um, that might buy the person a lot of time. Uh, what we're looking at here on the screen right now is just a, uh, an animated rendition. I found this um, great video um, by a person online. This is done by <clears throat> Simon Gravel, Lamps Tutorials. Now this is just a representation of the nanoparticle in water. Um, I liked this video because it just basically showed the substance in motion. And obviously, if we're resonating the substance, we should see, you know, motion. If we had the means to resonate this particle so that it adopted a destructive interference pattern and we could decrease its lifespan, uh, that could be enormously beneficial. Uh, but there's some problems with doing that. And I'm going to just step uh, you through a brief summary of um, what those problems are and how I've attempted to overcome that. The end goal is we want to try to have some sort of, you know, computer files in, you know, wave or MP3 format that you could literally play as sound waves, you know, through um, an audio media device and have some hopefully significant effect, um, or through something along the lines of an electromagnetic coil. Now, if you're in the Rife community and you're using different kinds of Royal Rife frequency generators. You know, the likelihood is that you probably would be working with a higher frequency range. Um, for a lot of people, uh, they may not be able to afford that kind of equipment, and they may not have the experience or knowledge base, um, you know, to run that sort of equipment. So this video and this approach is sort of geared towards people that are wanting to experiment with this, and they have less of a budget. Uh, and they don't have the same, you know, expertise with running uh, rife frequency equipment. But if you have a rife background, you know, this is also going to be very interesting for you because of the possibility. So there's different ways of delivering um, what we call a high ULF or low RF, which is basic, basically the audible range. So we can deliver it either through, you know, a literal sound that you can hear or through a silent, soundless, varying electromagnetic field. And there's different ways of doing that. Uh, we don't sell that kind of hardware, but we're aware that there's different kinds of devices on the market that you can play frequencies through as a silent, varying magnetic field. Uh, I talk about that a little bit in this video, uh, but there's different low-cost options. So a couple of problems that had to be solved to just try to get this viable, and I just want to say, say right from the outset, I am not certain this will work, but I do suspect it's highly likely that it, it can and that it probably should. So I'm just going to outline the basic concept. Um, you know, this is speculation, but I believe that it's a reasonable speculation, and it has precedent. Something very similar to this has already been proven to work. So I'm going to just step you through that. In the comment section of this video below, you'll find a number of links that are resources and associated bits of information, one of which is, I'm not going to get into a lot of the heavy technical detail on this. I'm going to give you a good overview so you have a sense of what this is and how it works. 
Um, if you want more of the technical overview, see the, the technical uh, overview video link that's in the comment section of this video below. I was recently asked by a panel of scientists and science researchers to join them in the discussion of the possibility of using sound wave um, you know, frequencies uh, you know, um, and certain kinds of waveforms to see if we could actually degrade, interfere, and or get rid of graphene oxide. Uh, and one of my clients uh, also stepped up and funded the development of this, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, there's a document here I'm going to make available to you, and it just is called The Threshold of Collapse in a System or Structure. Now, the precedent is this. Um, there's a number of different articles that came out that were talking about how do we stress graphene oxide to break it down. So this is a good article. Again, the links for this will be in the comment section below. Uh, but they were basically asking the question, can this material, you know, fail under fatigue? Now, when we're using frequencies, sound waves or electromagnetic based to manipulate matter, we do it in different ways. Um, one of the problems using a sound based format is that if you're familiar with Royal Rife frequency generators, if we're trying to destroy something, we would usually use a certain kind of waveform. There's different waveforms that work, but there's one in particular that works really well. It's extremely difficult to render that as a sound wave. Um, and you know whether you're playing it as a sound wave or you're playing it through like a device, uh, like these silent broadcasting devices, um, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to design, especially with most of the consumer-based products on the market. So it's like, how do we get like a low-cost audio-based system to perform in the same way that a rife frequency generator would? So it looks like I may have solved that. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's just come back to this science study and the threshold of collapse of a system. So basically what they did is they took what's called um, an AFM, atomic force microscope, uh, and they put the tip um, on the center of a film of graphene and graphene oxide material, and they oscillated the tip at a frequency of 100 kilohertz. So in other words, they vibrated it at that length. Now, I'm just going to show you here basically what that looks like. Uh, this is a great video that kind of illustrates the DME channel. So this is a blow up of the graphene oxide um, as, a sh as basically a sheet substance. And what they're doing is they're, they're using kinetic force. Uh, you can see in the lower right hand corner, there's the device right there. Um, but what they're doing is they're tapping that instruments on the surface of the substance. So it basically moves up and down and it, it strikes the surface. So here, this is like an animation showing this little tiny like nano sized hammer and it's pounding on the surface. Now the problem with graphene oxide is that it's extremely strong. It's supposed to be able to withstand something like gigapascals of pressure. Um, and so it's problematic to try to break it down. But the, on the upside, what they found was it actually was possible to use an atomic force microscope to break graphene oxide down within about a day and a half. So how did they do that? And how, why is that important to what we're talking about? So the way they did that is they, this tip that I just showed you here, that's striking the surface, is moving um, literally at a rate of 100 kilohertz. So it's moving really, really fast, and they're timing that over a number of cycles. So they're tapping it a lot, um, and they say that here that they um, found that the materials could withstand the average stress of 71 gigapascals for over a billion cycles before failing. Now what's interesting is um, this is a physical instrument that's moving very quickly and striking many times the surface of the material. If we take a look at the 100 kilohertz uh, and we do a baseline of that frequency range, uh, and I should mention this too, um, when we're modeling a substance such as graphene oxide, 
<clears throat> you know, if we're going to use a resonant frequency approach, we need to have an extremely high level of precision uh, in order to be able to target it properly. And what the idea basically is, is that we want to see if we can replicate the effect of an atomic force microscope, uh, an actual physic, physical, you know, kinetic hard strike um, against the surface with sound. Can we, you know, replace the AFM at atomic force microscope with a sound wave? Now, in this particular case, I wasn't able to tell, and I don't think it was the case that they were using a resonant frequency. Um, they just they they settled on 100 kilohertz, probably not based on any specific resonance of um, the material, but just based on like force, you know, very crude force-based metrics. So basically, you know, it's kind of an educated guess. How quickly do we need to move this thing over? You know, what time frame? Um, now the the trick with graphene oxide is it's one of the strongest substances known to man. So we know that we were able to break it down in a day and a half. Uh, but what if we actually knew the resonant frequency of the structure? Um, <coughs> could we introduce that frequency into it and break it down? It could we actually cause you know, a degradation of the material? Uh, there's every reason to believe that we can. So if we're uh, introducing a signal, instead of just using the kinetic force of the hammer, could we approximate, you know, a similar kind of approach? Uh, I believe that there's a precedent for that uh, because in this particular case, like I mentioned, we're not um, we're not hitting graphene where it's weak. So when they were actually running this test, they they were running this test against the strongest part of the graphene oxide. So it's like that part that part of the structure of the graphene oxide which is the most resilient. It has the strength. It can stand up under gigapascals of force. It took them a day and a half of that kind of, you know, impact. But there's a trick with graphene oxide, and the trick is, while it's extremely strong, you know, it, uh, across part of its structure, it's also highly vulnerable in that it's brittle. So the idea is, can we identify what the weak part of the substance is and then model that with a frequency representation and then introduce that frequency as a dissonant or disharmonious noise into the particle itself. Um, and then can we do this in a way that's you know, easy for the average person to set up an experiment with. Now, at this point, experiments are still being run. I can't claim at this point that I know for certain that, that this will work. But I'm extremely optimistic. Um, I mean, the principles seem very solid to me. Um, so what I've been doing is I've been trying to figure out, OK, so we know that if we're using right frequency generators, that there's a certain kind of waveform, uh, a pulsed waveform, which is basically a square waveform with a 50% duty cycle. Now what that basically means is, I'll just pull that up really quick. Often when we're emulating substances, we're going to use a, a sinusoidal waveform. Basically a square wave, especially a 50% duty cycle one, um, the idea is that that particular kind of waveform uh, can cause like a fantastic impact, like a destructive interference pattern on a target. I won't go into all the technical reasons as to why, but when we're modeling a substance, uh, we're, we're usually dealing with extremely high uh, frequencies, which are mapped as a sine wave, and then we're scaling it down by octave. So we're mapping an essential part of the substance and we're representing it by frequency. So there is no easy, uh, good general way to convert a sine wave uh, directly into a pulsed square wave with duty cycle. It can be done, but it's not easy. And when you take a look at what the tools in the available to the general public are for just creating tones, um, it's problematic because what happens with a lot of tone generators is they don't give you precision 
past two decimal places. Um, why is that important? Because the more precise that you can be, uh, the more effective your frequency uh, will, you know, will basically function. Now, at the end of this video, I'm going to give a few different samples as to what these waveforms sound like. Um, and I'm just going to take you back here. What I had to do was I had to figure out basically a way to convert a square wave or a sine wave um, to a square wave, and then I had to convert the square wave into basically a pulsed form. Uh, and so a lot of different methods were tried. Um, there were some exotic tools. I'm not showing everything I used on the screen here, but I'm just trying to give an overview. So basically we would map the sine wave first, um, and then I had to try to convert that into a pulsed square wave. Um, and we tried a number of different tools to do that. Uh, so we were working with extremely high resolution uh, sine waves to start off with. And then we converted that um, basically. So the default was a sine wave. Uh, and we, we mapped the sine wave out and then converted it into a, a square wave format. Once it was converted into a square, uh, square wave format, uh, while retaining extremely high um, BPS, uh, KB resolution, uh, we wanted to turn that into a pulse wave. Uh, now, what I did is I took a look um, at the before, during, and after of the process. Uh, and there was a lot of um, extra mapping that went into this. Um, in the frequencies that we generated, we didn't just make a stepped square wave with 50% duty cycle that can operate both as an audio, but also can be sent through a very simple coil setup. Uh, what we also did was we nested uh, chlorine dioxide sine wave in between um, the step square wave. And I'm just going to show you what that looks like. And the reason that we used a chlorine dioxide molecule uh, sine wave representation was that we don't want to just hit the graphene oxide. Um, we want to, in between the strikes that we make, we want to introduce the uh, chlorine dioxide. So you'll see here, this is just a, a spectrogram representation. So the sine wave was converted to square waves. And what you'll see here is in between the square waves are these pitches. Like you'll see these little horizontal lines in between the essentially the rectangular or square waves. You'll see that we've got an on-off, on-off 50% uh, duty cycle. But these little horizontal ticks, this is where we've embedded the uh, chlorine dioxide sine waves. So literally what you have here is... I'm just going to pull up that square wave form again. So when we're looking at the 50% duty cycle, uh, what's actually happening here is we have a graphene oxide as well as a graphene hydroxide waveform. Um, but in between the on-off, so here's the square wave for the graphene oxide, you know, conceptually, and then it's there's silence, it's off, and then it's on again, and then it's off again. What we did is we nested a chlorine dioxide molecular representation in between the square waves themselves. So what that basically is meant to approximate is the striking force of what we are looking at here. So when we're looking at this uh, atomic force microscope that's striking the surface, so this atomic force microscope striking the surface, our hope is to approximate uh, force-wise what we were seeing with the square wave. So when we look at the square wave, the square sound wave is uh, attempting to replicate the strike force against the graphene oxide, but then in between the strikes of the graphene oxide um, dissonant resonance, we're introducing the chlorine dioxide. So we're, we're hammering it, and then in between the hammer strikes, we're attempting to weaken it because we know chlorine dioxide weakens the substance. Now, the 
we have a number of different audio waveforms. Uh, some are uh, have been designed so that they're really meant to be mainly played through you know some kind of a device like this, basically, right? Uh, because the square wave 50% uh, duty cycle, they do not sound pleasant. Technically, if you didn't have one of like a device like this, you could just listen to it as audio, but it you know it doesn't it's not a pleasant thing to listen to. We have also designed more kind of like a meditation, you know, pleasant musical type quality sounding waveform that can be listened to in the background. But those parts of this frequency collection don't incorporate the 50% duty cycle. They're all just sine wave representations. But the hope is either or may work, and our goal is to reduce the lifespan of the material substance. I'm going to provide this WordPad document to you. Um, there'll be a link to access that, so you, you might want to have a read through there. But the basic goal is to have you experiment, if you want, uh, in such a way where you can use, you know, the uh, square wave 50% uh, duty cycle waveforms, or you can just put on some pleasant music, you know, musical sounding sounds in the background and test those out. Um, but pretty happy with how this turned out. Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, we're doing a number of experiments and we'll be continuing to do that. Um, and <coughs> uh, I want to make these available to people that want to do their own experiments. We've designed um, a lot of sort of extra bells and whistles into this. Um, if you've got you know software that you can you can use for analytics, uh, you, you'll find some pretty interesting structures and formations in the waveforms that we've designed. I hope to release at some point uh, the full I think it's two three hours where I was talking with the panel of scientists. I, I know a number of you are probably familiar with these folks. Uh, we had some pretty interesting people join us. Um, I've talked about some of them in the past, but we had basically like a five-way uh, Zoom style chat. Um, so I will try to get the link of that off to you folks soon. There's an excerpt from that chat. It's about 30 minutes that you can watch where I present the overview that's much more technical. Um, uh, you can watch that at your leisure uh, and just access that, like I said, in the comment section below. But basically the idea right now is being able to, one, replicate uh, a, an essential function on Rife generators, but for an audio sound based format that you can either listen to as sound or you can play as a sound file through, a, you know, basically a coil. Uh, like to give you an idea, um, these are soda coils. Um, those particular coils are fairly cheap. Um, these cost 20 bucks and you can plug that into an audio player directly and then play those waveforms um, literally through, like the way that I do this is I have a Walkman. I, you know, copy the, the sound files onto the Walkman and then I can either play the sounds directly through these coils, you know, or I can, you know, get this little, this is like a little boost through audio amp. Um, this costs like 30, 40 bucks. Uh, I can plug this into the Walkman and then I plug these coils directly into the uh, this little audio amp. This runs on two AA batteries. It boosts the signal by 200%. And there's, you know, there's, there's no noise distortion. Like if you hear any noise, you should do a test. You know, try plugging this in to the Walkman, and then plug head the, you know, plug some headphones into the output, and then just adjust the volume of your media device. You want to make sure that there's no noise coming through the earbuds. Um, that should be pretty easy to do. And then you just play the tracks through that. And then, you know, ideally the hope and the goal is that if you or a loved one are concerned about graphene oxide in your body, it may be that these sound frequencies uh, might dramatically decrease um, the lifespan of the graphene oxide in the body. I don't know that for sure yet. But it's, I think it's a good best guess on my part. Um, I've got uh, one uh, group of scientists working in the lab that are conducting 
real-time tests on this, and so I'm looking forward to hearing the results, but that will be a while. Uh, I know that a lot of you who follow my work um, probably would be super excited uh, about hearing about this. Um, I, I appreciate when people buy my frequencies because it does keep you know, the research effort going. I'm not sure if I'm going to offer these for sale uh, per se right now. Uh, if you're a serious researcher and you know you want to give this a try, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll provide this maybe on a donation basis. So if if you want if you're a serious researcher and you want to you know try try using this stuff to see if you can actually get resonance going on in you know graphene oxide that's in the body of someone you care about, you're welcome to try this. And I, I, what I'll do is I'll set the donation to, I got to offset my research and development costs because the costs of developing this were really high. Uh, but we'll set it at, say, 249 US. If you want to donate 249 US to the research costs, then I'll send you a series of, of tracks. There's quite a few tracks. Uh, they're both audible as well as um, like they're all you can listen to all of them as sound but about half, you know, a little bit less than half the tracks are meant for the coil only um, because those ones have the 50% duty cycle with the chlorine dioxide uh, sine wave interspersed and that one doesn't sound very pleasant so that one would be you know a lot more suitable for you know a coil style approach um, and then you would want to experiment with things like amplitude or volume settings, duration, that sort of thing. But the key thing here to keep in mind is that we already know that stressing graphene uh, with an external force is possible. Um, and the goal here is, unlike a typical right frequency approach where we would try to just destroy the material outright uh, from the get-go, what we're looking at here is using something called cycle loading. Um, there's quite a lot of information in this document. I'll make that um, available to you guys. Uh, but we're looking at fatigue failure. We want to see if, if we can put so much fatigue and noise into the system of the graphene that it becomes overwhelmed and it basically begins to break down. If you want more of a you know technical, detailed understanding as to what this is and how it's meant to work. Um, just you can access the technical overview in the video comments section below. Um, if uh, if you're excited about this as a prospect, I know I am. Um, you know I, I'm going full bore into this one. Uh, then you're welcome to, if you want to donate to our research and development. Uh, then you will get a you will get free access to. Uh, the full set of the graphene oxide and graphene hydroxide uh, sound frequencies. And then following this little brief video, I'm going to just uh, give you some sound samples as to what that's like. Okay, let's take a quick listen to, um, this is one of the pulsed square waves, 50% duty cycle with chlorine dioxide interspersed. And we're just going to, I'm going to play that for you, and then we'll just take a look at the spectrogram. You can get a sense of what this sounds like.
So as you can see, um, it really doesn't sound very pleasant. That's why we recommend that for the coil waves, or rather for the um, coil-based versions, it would be better to um, you know, basically play them through one of those devices that we talked about. Um, you know, so some kind of form of silent broadcasting device. Uh, and again, a really good low cost solution is basically the, it's the soda, you know, soda coils. Um, and then just using a media player. So now let's take a listen to sounds, non-coil versions sound like. So you could actually put these on and listen to them. <clears throat> you could literally put these on and just listen to it as sound. Now, one of the challenges um, for designing the sound-based uh, versions, like for easy listening, basically, was you know, some of these frequencies on their own can sound pretty harsh, uh, pretty intense. So how do we uh, wrap them in such a way where we hope they're still effective, but they're relatively easy to listen to and play in the background? So we tried a few different approaches. Um, one was the specific tones that we picked, how we sequenced them, uh, and then wrapping it with some kind of like light pink noise ambience. So that gives you an idea as to what some of the tracks sound like. Let's take a look at um, some of the other ones here. So what I'm doing here is I'm just giving you an idea as to what these generally sound like. These are just short samples. There's around a dozen audio tracks that you can play on a media device. Each track is around 10 minutes in length. The entire track itself is specially encoded, so there's quite a bit of information that's put into each individual 10-minute track. We're only looking at about 20 to 30 uh, second segments here just to give you an idea of what they sound like. But the important thing to try if you're going to actually use these tracks is to create playlists of you know at least one or a couple of the tracks and then experiment with them using a single 10 minute track repetitively in a looped playback the idea is that we're delivering the full information payload of the 10 minute you know envelope basically because the entire 10 minute track it doesn't all sound the same as the 30 second sample that you're hearing what we're doing is we're cycling and varying related information through the 10-minute track. So if you're going to actually try this seriously, you're not likely going to get uh, anywhere near the full impact from a 30-second segment that you would from the full, you know, 10-minute envelope. And the reason is there's just a lot more, you know, uh, extremely important information in the full track itself.